Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 114. I'm your host Natalie Gruniger and it's so great that you could join me. As always, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron only monthly giveaways. June's prize is a copy of Peter Ackroyd's Tudors, sponsored by the FreelanceHistoryWriter.com. Do check out this wonderful website. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Thomas Howard, the second Duke of Norfolk, is Kirsten Claydon Yardley. Dr. Kirsten Claydon Yardley is an independent historical researcher and co-founder of Oxford Heritage Partnership, a historic buildings consultancy. She worked as production researcher for the TV adaptation of Wolf Hall and as an advisor for Robin Young's New World Rising books. Her biography of Thomas Howard's Second Duke of Norfolk, The Man Behind the Tudors, is published by Pen and Sword. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles.
welcome to Talking Tudors, Kirsten. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excited to be talking to you. Yes, it's so lovely to have you on the show. So I thought a good place to start is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about your background. Well, first of all, hello to everyone listening. Uh, My name is Kirsten and I would usually describe myself as a historical researcher and a historic buildings consultant. And I took a slightly convoluted path to get where I am. Um, I started quite traditionally studying history at undergraduate level at Merton College in Oxford. And I then went into administrative work for an academic publishing company. But I found that I really missed studying history. So I started doing a part-time master's at the Oxford University Department of Continuing Education. And from there, I went back full time to study for my DPhil, which was on Tudor Noble Identity and Commemoration, with a particular focus on the Howard family. And at the same time, I started doing some historical research work uh, for other people. So I did production research for the BBC adaptation of Wolf Hall, and I kind of worked as a fact checker on some other fiction and non fiction projects. And once that was done, I did a really sort of one year stint with the Diocese of Oxford as a assistant church buildings officer, which is quite a niche role. And from there, I left to co-found my own business, Oxford Heritage Partnership, which primarily does work with churches in the in England, which are trying to do big building projects and get permission to do works. But I also do some research alongside, and at the same time, I had a baby and wrote a biography of the second Duke of Norfolk. You have had a busy um, little while, haven't you? And we're actually, we're here to discuss um, partly one of the people that you researched, one of the members of the Howard family. But before we do that, do you want to tell us a little bit about your book? So The Man Behind the Tudors, Thomas Howard, Second Duke of Norfolk. Yes. So it's hopefully a fairly straightforward book biography of the second Duke of Norfolk. Uh, It starts actually in the early 15th century, which seems a little bit strange for someone who classifies as a Tudor, but is quite important in understanding kind of how he and how the later Howards end up in the position that they're in. And then I work through his life and through his death as well, and onto his descendants, uh, many of whom are quite well known to us. And I was sort of hoping to bring his story I guess back into sort of mainstream attention and also updated it a bit because the last book about him was published in the 1960s and obviously there's been an awful lot of research on the Tudors since then that I wanted to make use of and there were a few things as well from that book that sort of later research that I'd done and other people have done didn't seem quite right so I wanted to correct some of those bits as well. Fantastic. And and what was it in particular that drew you to Thomas Howard's story? What makes him such a fascinating subject? I first came across him basically because he was one of the key case studies for my default research. He's a Howard and he's also one who had quite a lot of the type of evidence that I was looking for. Uh, so we had information about his funeral. We had information about his tomb memorials, even though they don't survive. And when I was writing about him from the perspective of his commemoration and looking back over his life, I just realized what a phenomenal life he actually lived. And you work out that he was born in 1443, we think, which means that he's already 12 years old when the Battle of Albans is fought and the Wars of the Roses really kicks off. And yet he doesn't die until 1524, which is 15 years into Henry VIII's reign. So I added it up, but you realise he's lived through the reigns of six different kings. He's outlived five of them. And you just start to think of all the people that he must have met in that time, all the events and all the changes that are going on. And he's there sort of involved in a lot of them or certainly getting a very close view of what's going on. And then he has a huge family. So at the end of it all, you know, he's related either directly or by marriage to pretty much every important Judah family um, and all sorts of important people or I guess well-known people that we're all familiar with. And we probably, our listeners have probably heard of course of his son Thomas Howard, third Duke of Norfolk and it seems like he's overshadowed his father a little bit don't you think? 
I, I think the second Duke has been overshadowed by a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think his son uh, is the much better known Thomas Howard. And it doesn't help that sometimes there's just a little bit of fudging between the two of them <laughs> in kind of popular TV and drama. Uh, you know, it's a bit confusing to have a change of Thomas Howard's in 1524. So... The, yeah. <laughs> the second duke gets written out a bit and they don't help themselves because then the fourth duke is thomas howard as well yes. and <laughs> it doesn't help it's a little else. thomas <laughs> thomas <laughs> all right and so what do we know you, you mentioned that he was born circa 1443 so what do we know of his family and his early life he is the eldest son of john howard who goes on to become the first duke of norfolk I should probably clarify here, he's the first Howard Duke of Norfolk. They restart the numbering. There are earlier Dukes of Norfolk who are uh, from the Mowbray family, and I will have to talk about them as well. <laughs> uh, but the first Duke, <laughs> for my purposes, is the um, John Howard. And his first wife is a lady called Catherine Mullins. And it's a little bit of an unusual setup that Thomas Howard is born into because John Howard gets married at quite a young age. We don't know for sure, but Anne Crawford, who has done a lot of research into John Howard, thinks he could have been as young as 14 years old. And Thomas Howard seems to have been born three years before his father declared of age and inherited his lands. John Howard's father had died while he was a minor. So Thomas is born into this very young household. And as well as his parents, his grandmother on his father's side is living with them. And uh, she is Margaret Mowbray, the daughter of the first of the Mowbray Dukes of Norfolk. And so it's a slightly weird setup because the Howards themselves aren't particularly wealthy. Uh, John Howard He's from a relatively well-known family in Norfolk and a wealthy family, but he's descended from a second, a line of from a second marriage. So he hasn't got the lands and the money. That's gone to his half cousin, Elizabeth Howard, who marries one of the Earls of Oxford. So they're in this kind of small household. And at the same time, though, they're the poorer cousins of the Dukes of Norfolk, who are absolutely the wealthy sort of one of the leading landowners, one of the leading powers in East Anglia. And they have this connection to them and, and they have Margaret Mowbray living them with them. And just to add to the oddness, <laughs> despite all these connections and these good connections that they have, Thomas Howard doesn't seem to have got sent off as a child into a noble household, which would have been standard for the children of gentlemen and of noblemen you know, there's normal education. You go to someone else's household, you get taught about being in a household, you learn about being a knight, being a nobleman. Uh, his father, John Howard, had gone into the Mowbray household, uh, the Dukes of Norfolk. But Thomas seems to have gone instead to a grammar school in Ipswich. We don't know quite how long for. It's not like school today. He probably only went for a term or so, and he received some education at home as well. And it seems likely that this was to help families links to Ipswich because John Howard, who doesn't have much money, one of the things that he's trying to do is build up the family's wealth through shipping. John Howard becomes a major ship owner and that's actually quite important for them because there is no navy at the time. So as a ship owner, he's able to loan boats to the king essentially. And it seems likely, therefore, that going to school in Ipswich is about furthering kind of trade connections almost. So it has a logical sort of explanation behind it, but it just seems a little bit odd for someone who later becomes a duke and this powerful noble figure that we don't have any evidence of him having a sort of traditional apprenticeship mm. in another household. So, yeah, that's kind of all we know, to be honest, about his very young childhood it's not very well documented you've mentioned that he obviously lived through the reigns of a number of monarchs how is it that he first got a foot into court and maybe tell us a little bit about his rise through the political and social ranks during the reign of Edward IV so Thomas is essentially rising on the coattails of his father particularly because his father's not a huge amount older than him so he's still establishing his own career and Thomas is following on a bit behind. And John Howard 
begins <laughs> I'm trying to think, think of an academic word for this he begins basically as an enforcer for the Mowbrays in East Anglia so the 1450s into the Wars of the Roses you're seeing a lot of local conflict play out because there isn't strong government from the top and the Dukes of Norfolk are in conflict against the Dukes of Suffolk who are sort of siding with Henry VI where the Mowbrays are siding with uh, Edward the the Yorkist faction. Um, obviously, it's not Edward the Fourth yet. So John Howard is a little bit sketchy in the way he's behaving and the way he's treating the followers of their opponents. Uh, but it allows him to become a key member of the Mowbray affinity. And he rises up through the ranks and he transitions from serving the Mowbrays into royal service. And that means that when Thomas grows up, he's done his education, at grammar school and he then pretty much seems to go into royal service in a pretty minor role but in 1467 he turns up as a henchman to Edward IV which is one of those lovely terms basically it's a ceremonial sort of role that you turn up in processions and things under the master of the horse he doesn't really make much of an impact or much of a mark we don't hear of him particularly in that role. But it then allows him to get a position where he goes to Burgundy. And there's quite a lot of confusion about this because this used to be dated to happening in 1471. So after Edward IV has been king, has been into exile and has come back again. And actually it seems likely that it happened earlier. So it was probably happening in about 1468 and he goes and he joins the royal court in Burgundy and it's just for a few months but it gets him some international experience he gets to witness another royal court and he comes back from there and becomes an esquire of the king's body to Edward IV and again this is another thing that in the past has been dated to 1471 because if he went to Burgundy in 1471 and he becomes Squire after that, it must be later. But it's pretty clear when you read through the documents that we do have that he's with Edward IV earlier. So he's with him for people who know their Wars of the Roses, um, kind of in the run up to the Battle of Edgecott, which happens in 1469. He doesn't get imprisoned with Edward IV. Fourth gets imprisoned sort of 1469 into 70, but he is with him again when there's a um, a rebellion going on in Lincolnshire and again he doesn't go into exile when Edward IV goes into exile in 1470 to one but he does seem to have been someone with the king up until he goes into exile at that point he retires into East Anglia with his father they keep a bit of a low profile during Henry VI's uh, readaption and then word comes from the continent that Edward IV is planning to invade and the Howards are a threat of arrest because they are known to be loyal Yorkists. They could try and raise support for him in East Anglia. So they flee into Sanctuary in Colchester and they wait there for Edward IV's invasion and they then come out. Thomas is at the Battle of Barnet, which is on the 14th of April, 1471, and he gets injured there fighting in Edward IV's army. Once it's all settled down, Edward IV's uh, back <laughs> as king again, and <laughs> Thomas is back with him. He's back being an esquire of the king's body. I think he has the sort of kind of pinnacle of his service for Edward IV comes in 1475 when there's a peace treaty signed between uh, England and France and Edward IV and Louis XI, they meet on this bridge, it's been specially built and only three people accompany Edward IV to this meeting and one of them is Thomas Howard. That is the high point I think because after that he goes back home and he actually retires and lives fairly quietly for the next few years managing his estates, local government. Okay and so given his obviously close association with Edward and, and the Yorkers family, did 
Edward's death and Richard III's accession have much of an effect on him and the family? Or you mentioned he was retired by that point, so maybe it didn't affect him too much. I would say that Edward's death is a what-if point in the life of Thomas Hyde, because up until that point, he's living quietly and he's had a slightly not necessarily awkward situation with Edward IV, but Edward IV has made some decisions that have affected the Howards family and their potential to inherit land in the future. I'll try and explain it quite briefly. The Mowbrays have reached the point where in 1476, there's an heiress, Anne Mowbray, and she gets married off fairly quickly to Richard, Duke of York, Edward IV's second son. And they have an act of parliament that says that if she dies without heirs, Richard will inherit the Mowbray lands from her for his lifetime. Now, if that didn't happen, the next heirs to Anne Mowbray would be William Lord Barclay and John Lord Howard. So they haven't been completely cut out of inheriting, but it's sort of been postponed. You know, Richard, Duke of York, he could live for a very long time. He obviously doesn't. He's one of the princes in, in the tower, but that's the possibility. So, you know, if they if the Howards are going to get their share of the Mowbray lands, it could be quite a few decades, sort of a generation in the future. So we don't know for sure that the Howards resent Edward IV for this, but it is around this time that, you know, Thomas takes this bit of a backseat and is kind of concentrating more in um, East Anglia. So... What it also means is that when Edward dies, there's the opportunity for this to be reset a little bit. Um, You you can undo the works of the previous king. And Richard III is in a position where he needs reliable, influential supporters. And the Howards may not be your top-ranking nobility, but they've got quite a lot of money by now. They have local reputation with the Mowbray line died out because by this point Anne of Mowbray has died and we know what happens to Richard of York who gets imprisoned in the tower. Uh, There isn't really anyone to rally the sort of former Mowbray followers except the Howards could do it. So quite an easy win for Richard III is to give them their share of the Mowbray inheritance back and hope that that buys their loyalty. And he follows it up by saying, also, John Howard is now Duke of Norfolk and Thomas Howard gets to be Earl of Surrey. And I would say it works quite well for Richard III. Um, The Howards later try and downplay their role in Richard III's reign. They sort of say, oh, you know, we were loyal subjects and we stayed quietly in the countryside and looked after our house like good, you know, good lords would do. In practice, they were, you know, <laughs> slightly closer to Richard III than that implies. Uh, we find Thomas Howard traveling with Richard III before he goes off on his progress to York. He is involved in putting down some like small scale rebellions. So they're, they're still loyal Yorkists. Obviously, they just they have to pretend a little bit once we're into the Tudors. They don't really want people focusing too much uh, on that part of their life. But um, it's it's the point at which they get the title of Duke of Norfolk for the first time. And, you know, if Edward hadn't died, that probably wouldn't have happened. I I don't think, especially if Richard of York had had heirs and, you know, Anne Mowbray hadn't died. There's a lot of what ifs there. There are a lot of what ifs. (laughs) Um, And so obviously it doesn't end well for Richard, as we all know. So during the Battle of Bosworth, what role did John and Thomas play at that point? So John Howard is leading uh, Richard III's vanguard in the Battle of Bosworth and information about the battle is fairly patchy. It seems likely Thomas Howard was probably second in command to his father. It would make sense. We know that they're both there. They see the brunt of the fighting in the battle. Uh, It's mainly between the two vanguards, uh, the one led by John Howard and the one on the other side led by the Earl of Oxford who is one of the Howard's close neighbours in East Anglia and is also some relative via the Elizabeth Howard half-cousin who married into the Earls of Oxford uh, line. It's not quite a family affair, but it's pretty close to being one. And, 
you know, I think a lot of people will know that obviously that's the battle where the Earl of Northumberland doesn't join in and the two kings don't really fight until near the end. So it's all it's all going on between the two vanguards and we don't know exactly what happens. There's various very romanticized poems, uh, some of whom the poets are trying to cast the Howards as very noble, sort of romantic. They're on the wrong side, but they're super honorable and they have these lengthy exchanges with the Lancastrian side, which proves, you know, they might be on the losing side, but, you know, they are being honorably chivalrous. <laughs> um, all we do know is that at the end of the battle, John Howard is dead and he could have been killed fighting or he could have been executed essentially as a battlefield execution. Thomas Howard is badly injured and he is taken to the Tower of London and he is imprisoned there. The Bill of Attainder that Henry VII puts through Parliament pretty much straight away. The first three people listed is Richard III, John Howard, Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey. So he is a traitor, his lands are taken away from him, and yeah, he's in prison and he stays there for the next uh, four years until 1489. He gets he gets a pardon fairly quickly. 1486, you know, Henry the Seventh is trying to be recon reconciliatory where he can, but he doesn't get released then, and uh, he doesn't get you know his all his lands that he'd inherited from the Mowbray back. So he's kind of in a state of limbo, I guess, mm -hmm. for the first few years. Given, you know, his close connection to the Yorkists, he's fighting for Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth, his father dies fighting for Richard III, he's in prison for four years. Why is it that Henry VII then decides to not only release him from prison, but actually restore him to the earldom of Surrey? I think there's two things going on. So first of all, Thomas Howard and Thomas Howard's family don't seem to cause Henry VII any trouble. So in those first few years, we do have rebellions against Henry VII. You have uh, the Lambert Simnel rebellion in 1487. And the Howard's names don't appear in association with that. Obviously, Thomas Howard couldn't get involved directly. It would be very dangerous. But there's no, I've never seen any implication that they've like even communicated with the rebels. Thomas Howard in this narrative account of his life, which gets displayed by his tomb, there's a story that he's offered his freedom during this rebellion. And he says, no, he wants to be, be brought before Henry VII and you know, promise his, you know, that he has no intention of rebelling. There's no corroborating evidence for this story. It could well be fiction, you know, just to prove that we absolutely were loyal. But it is true that they don't do anything. He just sits in jail through the whole thing. His family just seem to get on with their lives. So they are not giving Henry VII any particular reason to fear releasing them. And then at the same time, Henry VII has a bit of a problem because Henry Percy, who's the fourth Earl of Northumberland, gets murdered in April 1489 by tax rebels in Yorkshire. And that is a problem because Northumberland and Yorkshire, they're a long way away from the king. They're quite reliant on the local sort of powerful noblemen managing those areas still. And Northumberland, he was the big power in the area. His heir is still a child. So Henry VII needs someone to step in or deal with the rebels. And he wants to bring the area under control with someone who's loyal to him. This is something we see Henry VII doing. He's trying to get rid of this setup where you have noblemen who are too independently powerful, where they, they don't need the king, they can set themselves up in opposition. So Thomas Howard is quite a good option because if, you were, if Henry VII releases him, he gives him back the title of Earl of Surrey, he gives him the opportunity to prove himself the hope is that Thomas Howard is going to be grateful. He's going to repay that with good service. Henry VII could also set it up, and as he does, by saying, well, you've got your freedom, but I'm not giving you all your lands back. You're still dependent on me at the moment for the most of your money. It's going to come from your income for serving me. So Thomas is tied 
to Henry the Seventh in royal service. And finally, he doesn't come from anywhere near the north of England. Thomas Howard, his whole power base is in East Anglia. So even if he does want to get up a rebellion, he has no connections. He has no loyalty amongst the sort of minor nobility and the gentry in the north of England. And on a plus side, he is... He has military experience, he has diplomatic experience, he has administrative experience, so he has skills. So that's kind of all the things that have got weighed up, I think, to go into this decision. Uh, Henry VII decides to do it. He makes Earl of Surrey, the title's restored, not all the lands. And he goes up north, he deals with the rebels really quickly, and he's then basically put in charge of governing the north for the next 10 years. So nominally... The person in overall charge in the north is actually Henry the Seventh's son, so it's Prince Arthur to start with. But he's not old enough to be in charge himself. So, to all intents and purposes, it's Thomas Howard who is the leading sort of figure and representative of royal government in the north, and he has a council to help him. He's the figurehead, and he has his whole family and most of his family move up with him to Sheriff Hutton in North Yorkshire and they work from that base trying to build up their lands and their wealth again in East Anglia but they're having to do it remotely sort of by correspondence with their agents and supporters back in East Anglia and at the same time they're starting to build up those connections that they didn't have in the north and making those sort of friendships and I guess loyalties which come to help them a little bit later on again when they when Thomas Howard ends up back north for the Battle of Flodden, which is still a couple of decades to go. Yes. <laughs> and, and you touched briefly earlier on uh, the fact that Thomas Howard has a lot of children, basically, to put it simply, and is is related to pretty much everyone. So do you want to tell us just a little bit about his two marriages? Because he, he married twice and we can't go through all the children, but maybe just mention some of the ones that, that we might recognise and some of those connections, perhaps with future queens, etc. His first marriage is to Elizabeth Tilney, which takes place in 1472. She is the heiress of Frederick Tilney, who is based in Ashwellthorpe in Norfolk. I hope I've pronounced that right. It's not one of these English place names where half the letters are missing. And she's the widow, widow of Humphrey Boucher, who was another Yorkist who dies during the Wars of the Roses. And so it's a desirable match. She's wealthy. She has lots of local connections. They have five surviving children who reach adulthood. The first of them is Thomas Howard, later third Duke of Norfolk. Uh, I think a lot of people will be familiar with him. Then there's Edward Howard, who is Lord Admiral. Possibly not quite as familiar to some people, but he, he's quite a dashing romantic sort of lord admiral uh companion of henry the eighth in the early years of his reign um but he dies in 1513 uh edmund howard is the third child that is the father of catherine howard future queen of england then elizabeth howard who marries thomas boleyn mother of future queen of england <laughs> anne boleyn and obviously grandmother of elizabeth I. Then the fifth child is Muriel Howard, who is less, <laughs> less prominent than everyone, the rest, the other four. Uh, she marries uh, Viscount Lyle and then Thomas Nivett. So Elizabeth dies in April 1497. It's quite a busy time for Thomas. Uh, we're in the middle of the Perkin Warbeck Rebellion at the time. It's a couple of months before James IV of Scotland invades the north of England, whilst Perkin Warbeck by that time has left and ends up by Ireland round to England. So Thomas is having to deal with that. Uh, it's all a bit busy. In the middle of it, he manages to send off for papal dispensation to marry Elizabeth's first cousin and lady-in-waiting, Agnes Tilney, who I would expect <laughs> many of your listeners are very, very familiar with. And Agnes is 33 years younger than Thomas Howard. She doesn't obviously bring him much gain in terms of status or wealth. They obviously know each other because she's been living. She's been there. She's been in Elizabeth's household. I suspect it's some sort of 
love or possibly lust match going on there. Uh, they marry in November of 1497. They have six surviving children. They have three daughters. Uh, Anne Howard marries one of the Earls of Oxford and Dorothy marries Edward Stanley, who's the third Earl of Derby. And I've realised I've counted wrong. They had four daughters. Elizabeth Howard, mar- another Elizabeth Howard, marries Henry Radcliffe, the second Earl of Sussex. I'm afraid the Howards are not good at variety of naming. So <laughs> the fourth daughter is then Catherine Howard. And she's another one that people might be familiar with. Uh, she marries uh, Recep Griffith, first of all. And then Henry Daubeney, who becomes Earl of Bridgewater. So she's the Lady Bridgewater who turns up being arrested at the same time as Catherine Howard and Agnes Tilney. The two sons, then there's William Howard, Lord Howard of Effingham. He's another one who gets arrested sort of in the aftermath of Catherine Howard's arrest, Queen Catherine Howard's arrest. And the last one is another Thomas Howard, I'm afraid, if we didn't have enough of them. And he dies in the in 1537, I think, in the tower after having an illicit relationship with Lady Margaret Douglas. Yes, so, that's an interesting <laughs> episode, that one. <laughs> so, so there's quite a few names there that people are probably familiar with and quite a, you know, touch on quite a lot of the drama and scandal of Henry VIII's reign. That's incredible. And, and now I want to talk a little bit about Henry VIII's reign. So... Obviously, um, Henry VII dies and Henry VIII accedes to the throne. So what was life like for Thomas now under this new, young, you know, charismatic king? Uh, What were some of the the highlights or the the main points there? It's a bit difficult for Thomas Howard. He finishes Henry VII's reign in a very good position. He's Lord Treasurer. He's Royal Counselor. He's, you know, he's still Earl of Surrey. He hasn't hasn't got the dukedom back but he's got most of his lands back he's got more wealth he's got his family like you know he starts the older children are starting to make favorable marriages and it's looking good he's sort of seen as probably one of the people who can dominate the royal council the main opposition to him is seen as being bishop fox but he's horrible he's, he's old you know he's sort of a relic not not even just of Henry VIII's father's reign, but, you know, Edward IV's reign. We're, going, we're sort of going back decades. And Henry VIII, as we all know, is not Henry VII. And, you know, he's young, he likes hunting and jousting and pageantry and music, and he wants to fight a war against France, ideally. And Thomas just doesn't, you know, he, he can't join in. He can't be one of these sort of young companions that we find around the, ki- around the king. And even Thomas Howard, the future third Duke of Norfolk, is actually relatively quite old too. And he doesn't quite fit in around Henry VIII. The only two family members that really do are Edward Howard, uh, the, the Lord Ad- future Lord Admiral, and the son-in-law Thomas Nivett. So they are amongst Henry VIII's early companions, and they provide a bit of a connection. They keep the family connected to Henry VIII. They're not totally out in the wilderness. And then we get the problem that begins to emerge that Thomas Wolsey appears, and he starts to rise, and he is the man who kind of massively oversimplifying international politics and domestic politics but he's the one who kind of works out how to give Henry VIII what he wants and who recognizes what Henry VIII wants and the Howards they're sort of going we don't really want to fight France that's not a good idea we should fight Scotland which would be great for the Howards because they are quite experienced in Scottish relations after Henry VII's reign but Henry VIII wants to go to war with France he's going to make it happen for him there's a bit of a disastrous year in 1512 and 1513 where we have naval battles going on between England and France and first Thomas Nivett and then Edward Howard die in battles at sea Edward Howard has declared that he's going to avenge his brother-in-law's death and stay at sea until he's avenged the death but he just ends up dying himself so that's pretty terrible (laughs) sort of on a personal level for the Howards and also on a political political level as well. And 
when Henry VIII finally leaves himself in the summer of 1513, he leaves to go to France to lead his armies, and he leaves Catherine of Aragon, his regent of England in his absence, and he leaves the Howards behind to support her. And this is very much a double-edged compliment, yes, I guess. I was going to say. <laughs> it's kind of a compliment in that he's saying that he trusts them because they are fully expecting that James IV of Scotland will try something in defence of the French and just generally to take advantage of Henry VIII being out of the country. So he's saying, look, I trust you. I trust you to help my wife. I trust you to defend the country. But this is still a time of personal rule. You want to be close to the king. You want to be fighting alongside him. You want to have these sort of bonds of fellowship formed on the battlefield. You want to be there to share in his glory. And if he's in France and you're on the northern border of England, that's not going to happen. So they are not entirely happy, but Thomas Howard, the elder, the Earl of Surrey, he knuckles down, he gets on with it, he goes up to the north of England uh, to check that everything is still in order against Scott, the Scots. And their fears turn out to be true because James IV does invade and he comes down, he does the usual Scottish thing, he attach, attacks Norham Castle, this happens pretty much every time that the Scots invade England, he attacks attacks a couple of other castles around there, Ford Castle, Ethel Castle, and then he sets himself up on a hill called Brankston Hill and digs in. And during this time, Thomas Howard has been marshalling the troops in the north of England, getting everyone together. Thomas Howard the Younger, the future third duke, has turned up. He's Lord Admiral now. He brings sort of men up on his ships. They all gather, the weather's terrible, it's rainy, it's muddy, it's horrible, but they make it uh, over to Brackenston Hill to realise that the Scots are entrenched. They do this sort of slightly odd to us seeming, sort of toing and froing with the heralds where they're like, we should have a battle. <laughs> Will you come down and, <laughs> you know, let's have a battle by this day and let's have it, uh, you know, down on the field and James IV is sort of like, I quite like being on this hill. I don't want to come down and fight you on the flat area. And Thomas Howard is like, but I promised that we would fight. And in the end, they do this flanking thing. On the 8th of September, they try and do an encircling maneuver. Uh, they and come at James IV from behind. There's lots of toing, military toing and froing. And it culminates in the afternoon on the 9th of September, 1513. They have a battle which we now know as the Battle of Flodden. It is quite close. The Scots still have the slightly better position, even after all the manoeuvring. They have the bigger army. There's a bit of trouble with Edmund Howard's men. Like, are they retreating? Are they running away? And it, it all hangs on the edge. But in the end, the English battle, led by the Earl of Surrey, wins. And not only do they win, but they kill the King of Scotland, and they wipe out basically all of the leading Scottish noblemen. It is an absolute decisive battle that puts sort of Scottish stability and politics into a bit of disarray for the next few decades. And it rather overshadows Henry VIII, unfortunately. Henry VIII, is, he's not doing badly in France. This is the time of the Battle of Spurs. And he's doing quite well, but he hasn't managed to kill the monarch of a rival country and wipe out most of their nobility. Henry is left with basically no choice but to reward Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey, by granting him the dukedom of Norfolk, by giving it back to him. Because he's got people writing to him and saying, oh, you know, you've got to reward Thomas Howard now. So he does this. He gives to us how the Dukedom of Norfolk. He slightly balances it out. At the same time, he makes uh, Charles Brandon, which I expect your listeners know. This is when he gets made Duke of Suffolk. And Charles Somerset is made Earl of Worcester. So this is kind of in the same ceremony. Yes, you did well. You get to be Duke of Norfolk. But look, here are two of my closest <laughs> companions who were doing well with me in France. They also get uh, to have new titles. So that's, in some ways, is the big event. For yeah. Thomas Howard of Henry VIII's reign. He doesn't retire immediately. He is 70 now. He could probably could retire, but he does stay involved. 
he takes Mary Tudor to France for her marriage, her first marriage to the French king. He's involved in sort of ongoing like domestic politics, diplomatic missions. But, you know, this is Wolsey's time, really, in terms of who's the leading minister. He gradually winds down. He has to preside over the trial of the Duke of Buckingham in 1521. Uh, this is generally seen as a pretty sad time for him. He's said to have cried as he passed the sentence. Obviously, the Duke of Buckingham is the future third Duke of Norfolk's father-in-law. So there's a family connection. They get on well. Obviously, you know, you don't want to see one of only three Dukes at the time be executed. The following year, he retires as Lord Treasurer. He, that role goes to his son. He attends the opening of Parliament in 1523, but then he just retires and he lives out the remaining year of his life there and he dies at Framlingham Castle in May of 1524. Yeah, I must say, I quite love how the whole Battle of Flodden backfired for Henry at that point. <laughs> that I just, just imagining his face when he received the news would have just been, oh, what I would have given to see that. <laughs> the problem is that he has to be gracious about of course, it. Obviously, yeah. you know, it's great for his, you know, England as a country comes out of it looking really well. And he has to, you know, he gives orders for all these masses of thanksgiving and everything. But yeah, I mean, he must have been feeling pretty happy with his own military victories up to that point. Um, up until that point, exactly. Now, so Thomas, as you've mentioned, dies on 21st of May, 1524 at Framlingham Castle. And he's around 80 at the time, I believe. So he did have quite an extravagant funeral at Thetford Priory. I'd love to hear about that. So Thomas has what is called a heraldic funeral, generally. And this is common for noblemen at this time. It's what we would expect to see. However, heraldic funerals... They, are, they take place on a scale of extravagance, depending on the rank of the deceased. Thomas Howard, at the time of his death, is one of only uh, two dukes in England at that time, after the death of uh, the Duke of Buckingham. And he is wealthy. And so, as you might expect, his is definitely at the very extravagant and elaborate end of the scale. As a matter of fact, it takes a month to prepare for this funeral. So his uh, coffin it lies in state at Framlingham Castle until the 22nd of June. And the castle is hung with black fabric and there's vigils going on and there's masses. And basically they're waiting to get all the preparations put in place for the funeral and possibly slightly to waiting for the third Duke of Norfolk to be ready. Uh, there's a reference to some of the earlier vigils and things. They're having to have a deputy because the new Duke of Norfolk is still busy in attendance on Henry VIII. On the 22nd of June, they leave in procession to move towards Thetford. And they do this with an overnight stop at Dis. The funeral procession is large. So it starts with three orders of the friars and men of his household chapel. Then you've got the men of Thomas Howard's household, so the squires, the knights, the gentlemen. Then you have some of the sort of key figures sort of in his following, carrying what's referred to as the heraldic achievements. So this is the replica of his helm with crest on top a coat of arms, by which they mean a coat, sort of a tabard with his arms on it, the target, which is the shield, and his sword. Then we have a chariot, which is where the coffin is. It's pulled by horses. It's surrounded by people carrying banners, showing his coat of arms, his descent. We then have the mourners, and this is used as quite a technical term, not to mean everyone who attends the funeral but we have the chief mourner who is the third duke of norfolk the heir and then thomas howard has another eight additional mourners who in his case are members of his family uh he's able to have members of his family because his family is so large that out of his sons and his sons-in-laws he, he's got eight sort of official mourners already i think there's one that isn't a direct uh, link and then we have everybody else 
who wants to attend the funeral and accompanying the procession there are 400 poor men in black were carrying torches uh it's a huge procession just trying to visualize it is difficult uh they work out that they provide black livery to 900 people but that's probably not everyone who's there with the procession and as they go through the villages people from the villages come out to greet them from the other churches that they pass and you know other people may have joined joined the procession uh they pass the night at dis as i say then they set off again it's a oh uh, i feel sorry for the herald servants they're basically having to marshal everyone right up and down keep everybody in line it's hot people want to ride in short riding coats but then when they're outside like this and that they have to stop and put the morning gowns back on and get sort of riding again at Thetford Priory, they place the coffin into a hearse. Slightly confusingly, it's not a hearse in the modern sense. This is an architectural structure within the church. It's probably timber to, so that you can make it quickly with some metal elements. His is covered with 700 candles. Got to bear in mind, <laughs> we're in the pre-Reformation period. So obviously light, candles, masses, is a big element of the heraldic funeral here more than it is in the later Tudor period. There's a hundred wax figures of beadsmen that have been carved and attached to this structure. There's eight bannerols depicting his marriages through uh, heraldry and there's a hundred pencils or tiny little flags with his arms. And then the rest of the church is also draped in black cloth and little badges with his coat of arms on so it is visually stimulating shall we say as a lot of black and against it the color of heraldry and the light of the candles there's an overnight vigil then the next day they do three masses the masses of our lady the trinity and the requiem mass during the requiem mass there's this very typical for its time ceremony where these heraldic achievements the helm the crest the sword etc are carried up and presented to the air by the other mourners the other sort of eight mourners and they will then go on to be displayed in the church around uh, the second duke's tomb that gets done then there's an hour-long sermon uh, which allegedly caused the multitude to flee from the church in terror I'm not quite sure <laughs> why or what exactly was said. We don't get the text of the sermon. Then after that, the most of the mourners, the chief mourner and the supporters leave the church. The actual interment of the coffin is a fairly small affair, which is attended by the officers of the second duke's household. So his treasurer and so on. They break their staffs of office, cast them into the uh, grave you know, there service is done there's a little ceremony and uh, then there is a feast presided over by the third duke of norfolk we know it provides 400 messes of meat a mess of meat serves different people depending on their rank but i reckon probably looking at 800 to sort of one and a half thousand people there and around the funeral we don't know exactly when a hundred pounds is given out in arms and it's given out at the rate of two pence per person which i worked out is twelve thousand people that they have to arrange you know have either come to the funeral to thetford to get their arms or possibly some of it's given out sort of by private arrangement with churches but again the numbers are just phenomenally huge I can't believe it. That's a really huge affair, isn't it? It's, it's wow. <laughs> I'm speechless. My goodness, what an extraordinary end to quite an extraordinary life and a long life. Obviously, you spent a long time researching Thomas Howard and his family and John Howard. And so in terms of Thomas Howard, tell us about the man you met. How would you sum, uh, sum that person up? I think I would say that he's ambitious. I don't think you could talk about any of the Howards <laughs> or their wider family without using that word. You just have to look at the efforts that he goes to to make sure that he get reclaims his lands, that he expands on them, that he arranges good marriages for his children. He is ambitious, certainly after 1489 to get back up, you know, to where his father was. 
he has a streak of pragmatism though I think I would say and perhaps a sort of realistic outlook you know he's he is a loyal loyalist through and through until he realizes that I guess essentially there is no Yorkist cause anymore and then he throws his hat in with the Tudors instead like and I think that's quite a pragmatic decision to realize it's Henry the Seventh now and that's what I have to work with and similarly he doesn't agree entirely with Wolsey and Henry VIII at the start of that reign, but he doesn't fight out. There's a couple of moments where it looks like they're going to have a big argument. People start to think, oh, you know, he's been expelled from the court, but it doesn't happen. He he backs down. He preserves his position at the expense of Wolsey, ending up sort of with more influence over the king than he has. And you know, he takes, he's quite good. He takes advice from other people, sort of when you're up in North England with the Battle of Flodden, like he's, he's working with a council. He's listening to what the sort of local gentry are saying about, you know, this is how we can do this. Um, so I think relatively sensible in that way mm. in how he does his work. And I guess the final one I've already touched on it is loyal. You know, yes, he does this switch where he switches from, the Yorkers to the Tudors but he is not one of these people who during the Wars of the Roses is flopping between the two sides like he is he is York he is unquestionably Yorkist and then once he does accept that you know it's Henry the Seventh now he is unquestionably Tudor yeah, and- sounds clever <laughs> <laughs> clever we could probably add that in too yeah absolutely um you know we could do a comparison with his son does he have the um we won't go into talking about Thomas Howard <laughs> Third, Duke of Norfolk, because that's a whole different kettle of fish. But I do want to ask you, do, does he have any of the arrogant streak that his son so clearly displayed on so many occasions? I was going to ask if you, um, I thought you were going to ask about the temper. Um, oh, no, yeah, well, that too, exactly. <laughs> I suspect he probably did. I mean, I'm not sure if it came across quite as arrogance in the same way. I would say he probably has the sense of his status and what is due to him and in a way that sort of ex- people expect Tudor noblemen to behave like that you're expected to have the right sort of display for your rank both not too much but not too little and I think if you look at his funeral he knows who he is and he you know he spends and he has look he has a luxurious home he he's spending lots of money on his household he's doing the usual things of charity he's kind of he's acting as a duke ought to but I think he perhaps stops a little bit short of that slightly arrogant streak that the third duke sort of shows where it tips over from sort of expecting the sort of due ceremony around your status to kind of just that little bit further into arrogance all right. Well, it's been fascinating. I've really enjoyed hearing about the life of someone that I, to be honest, haven't heard too much about. So that's really interesting. And anyone listening can, of course, go and buy your book to hear further and to find out more details. Kirsten, at the end of episodes of Talking Tudors, we do a little game of 10 to go. So these are just 10 quick questions just to get to know you a little bit better. So number one, do you remember the last film or show, film or show that you watched? Well, sorry, I'm being a bit blank. I mean, the last <laughs> the last TV show that I watched was just the latest episode of the Great British Sewing Bee. Oh, <laughs> so nothing nothing that historic at all. Fun. That's but... okay. No, that's good. That's all good. What about something you love about where you live? So I live just outside Oxford. So I would probably have to say that I love the fact that I can get on a bus, sort of two minutes walk outside of my front door, and I can um, get into Oxford, which is oh, I guess it's just one of my happy places just sort of walking around just the architecture really just when you step into the sort of streets of Oxford it, I just feel kind of calm and at home yeah it's magnificent so lucky to have that on your doorstep what about a favorite childhood book or a favorite childhood toy I would probably say as a child, uh, my favourite books would have been the Swallows and Amazons books by Arthur Ransom. I don't know how much people know about of them. Basically set in the Lake District in, I think, the 1920s it is, following children over their summer holidays, sailing around the lakes. I used to think that sounded like a great idea. They go off and have adventures and camp on their own and it all sounded terribly exciting. <laughs> Oh, I like the sound of that, actually. I have to have a look for that. So when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? 
well, when I was very little, I wanted to be a builder, oh, <laughs> but that didn't last. That didn't last too long. Then I went through a doctor stage until I realised that I'm squeamish and can't cope with blood. And uh, by secondary school, uh, high school, I had actually settled fairly early. In England, we have to do fair, things around the age of sixteen, where you're talking about sort of what you want to do with your career. And I did find mine tidying up, and I wanted to be a sailing instructor, which I did while I was studying and I wanted to study history. Fantastic. So you realized early, that's good. (laughs) And you obviously enjoy the Tudor period, but is there any other period of history that you feel drawn to or that kind of captivates you? I mean, it's kind of adjacent to the Tudor period, but I would probably say back into the 15th century and into the Wars of the Roses, uh, I kind of started very much in the 16th century and have kind of drifted backwards and you know there's still a lot I don't know about the 15th century it's it's a very complex period to study um, and one that I would like to know more of and sort of going back into Henry V and Henry IV. Yeah I think inevitably when you love the 16th century you do end up drifting back don't you just to find those connections and those origins I suppose. Now you live you've just said you live near beautiful Oxford so what's one of your favourite historic sites doesn't have to be in Oxford but a favourite historic site that you like to visit? I think my all-time favourite has to be Fountains Abbey which is in Yorkshire. My I grew up in Yorkshire and my mum is an artist and Fountains Abbey is one of her favourite places to paint and draw. So we used to visit a lot when I was younger and also at home there would be pictures and paintings of it around the place. And I still have a couple of them in my house now. That's a stunning place, so atmospheric. And when you were writing your biography, did you have any writing rituals that you followed at all? No, because I am absolutely terrible at writing (laughs) rituals and routine and procrastination and everything. So, oh, and I just had a baby. Um, Yeah, that will throw all routines out. (laughs) So if anything, my routine was uh, that somewhere around sort of 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, I would fuel myself up on chocolate and sweets and attempt to get some words on the paper. Oh gosh, that's that's so, tricky. <laughs> people probably anyone wanting to write a biography probably shouldn't model themselves. <laughs> on me. Actually, you've said something very similar to one of my last guests that said he lives on chocolate as well. He, he recommended a lot of chocolate, so there might be something to that. I'm going to have to try that. So, is there a book that you've read at any point in your life that has had a great impact on you or is quite memorable for you? I'm going to say for this. Uh, the Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay, which for anyone who doesn't know this one, it's quite an old book now. It's a fiction book and it's about a police detective who, whilst in hospital, gets interested in the reign of Richard III and who killed the princes in the tower. As an adult rereading it, I have a lot of problems with it sort of historically and it's quite dated in sort of how the characters are and how they talk about crime criminals but at the time when I was in my early teens I think it was the book that really introduced me to this concept that history isn't fixed and that revisionism is a thing and that you know what people say all the time you know you can go back and you can have a look at it and you can reread the sources so although it's problematic to me now I think it was one of the things that really got me interested in the study of history as an academic discipline rather than just being interested in historical facts. I actually could try to think if I've read that one. I feel like when you mentioned the detective in the hospital, I feel like I have, but maybe a long time ago. Um, and lucky last, if you could travel back in time and what advice would you give your teenage self, do you think? I think I would tell my teenage self to make sure that when we got into I guess it's sort of the 2010s and social media starts coming along to not ignore it for so long because I think I was quite late to coming to things like Twitter and blogs and things and it's a shame because the sort of the kind of Tudor and history community out there on Twitter is great and there's all sorts of interesting stuff out there and I kind of wished I'd started paying a bit more attention to it a couple of years ago. (laughs) 
Yeah, there is a wonderful, wonderful community. You're right. And a majority of, of the interactions are positive. So that's, you know, that's great. Now, there's one more thing, Kirsten, then I'll let you get on with your day. And that is our Tudor takeaway. So I always ask my guests for something for our listeners to go and have a look at after the episode. So do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? I'm torn between two on this. So the first one is quite a small one, which is the Twitter account of the Mary Rose Museum in England, which I think they're great. They're, they've got all sorts of facts about, uh, about the Tudor Rose and sort of historically when it was first used, uh, Henry VIII's reign and also about its discovery and lifting. They're quite fun. Their social media team are quite funny. They do some interesting things. The last couple of days for fans of the Shard Lake books, they've been doing a little bit kind of picking up on his descriptions of the Mary Rose from his lamentation I think it is where they go on to the Mary Rose and kind of relating it to what they have in the museum and what they know about the Mary Rose and then my other one was the Tudor Taylor which is a it's kind of a group now um, but headed by two ladies who specialize in historical reconstruction of dress and they have quite a collection of publications now which not only look at kind of the history of what people were wearing during the Tudor period but also give you patterns so you can fully indulge in your Tudor, Tudor self if you want to by making yourself everything from sort of undergarments to headdresses and things and I think they're doing some great work with that. Absolutely I love both of those actually um, the Tudor Taylor they're on Obviously, you can follow them on social media and see lots of great pics of all the beautiful stuff that yeah. they make. And you can you can commission them to make things as well if you um, <laughs> want to spend some some extra money. But they are they're amazing work. Their book's great, definitely. Kirsten, it's been so wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much for making the time to talk Tudors with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.